Call this Thorium Energy Alliance, Future of Energy Conference. Number six to order here. Thanks to our uh, generous sponsors this year. We had a lot of very good sponsors. Uh, Energy from Thorium Foundation, Whole World Design Engineers, Three Consulting from uh, Jim Kennedy and his Rare Earth Consulting Corporation, CalSec, Bogdan Moglich is a very good uh, reactor company in uh, California. And of course, you're going to be hearing about uh, terrestrial energy. I'm sure a lot of you are going to be excited to get the briefing on what they've been up to. So I also want to go over some milestones from the last year to show that uh, when you, uh, the little computer is asking you, hey, can you give uh, Thorium Energy Alliance that 99 bucks again? Or, uh, uh, you know, or approve the 99 bucks on your automatic renewal, why you need to do it? Uh, it's an incredibly modest amount, but it does help us. It keeps our legits up. Our paid membership is taken very seriously. Uh, as you know, you'll get tired of hearing about this isn't just a technology conference. It's also, uh, we talk a lot about policy and politics here too, and what we need to do in order to get this technology we support done, right? And so one of the things you really need to do is support us with your membership and donations, because that shows up on our IRS 990 forms, and that is also pulled up more often than you can imagine by Senate and House staff to see, you know, who are these jackasses in front of us. Uh, you know, and we always try and take off our tinfoil hats before we go into their offices, but, you know, sometimes they find us out uh, by searching the, the Googles and the interwebs. Uh, so one of the big uh, achievements this year that I'm proud of is that we got quite a few folks to respond to our call to be science and policy advisors. And if you uh, missed that call or you uh, have been on the fence about it, uh, as some of you I know have been, uh, it would really be uh, a great thing, very easy thing to do to become one of our science or policy advisors. Uh, basically, you, you would be uh, our uh, either a stand-in for us when we can't do a, do a talk or give a talk ourselves, and you would also obviously be asked to uh, give your two cents on uh, some issues we're facing. Uh, Thorium Energy Alliance Canada, uh, the web is, a, you know, the website's a little uh, beta right now, but it's up, and uh, it's a real organization through uh, Revenue Canada, which is like their version of IRS, and so we're trying to spread out that that is in addition to Thorium Energy Alliance Brazil, Thorium Energy Alliance Indonesia, the Thorium Energy Alliance in Japan, and uh, uh, and of course one of the organizations I'm most proud of is the Thorium Energy Alliance of Silicon Valley. Uh, the Thorium Energy Alliance of Silicon Valley guys have uh, have really been doing a stellar job of uh, meeting and, and dis dispensing uh, uh, some good knowledge out there. Also, the Energy Reality Project is a uh, uh, project you'll hear about a little bit later, a, a small briefing on that, but that's also a Canadian-based project, but uh, in the United States anyways, they're going to be able to piggyback on our 501c3. So if you want to uh, donate or support that, uh, uh, that project and its good goals. Uh, you can uh, donate the money to Thorium Energy Alliance and uh, we have an account set up just for them. Uh, similar to the way that Gordon's video, when you donated money to the Kickstarter or Thorium Energy Alliance for Gordon, we do the bookkeeping for, uh, for Gordon, so it's the same idea. And the education project, uh, unfortunately the uh, only thing that uh, I wish we'd gotten further on, but it's, of course, like everything, uh, we only have so much money and so many resources, although we do have enough money to get the museum displays, uh, the long-promised museum displays at the Energy Museum at uh, Los Alamos. Uh, so hopefully we can, uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, get that, and I'll have some nice stuff to report uh, over the next year. But that is also very worthy of your dollars. Uh, the education project is to uh, make, if you did not know, it uh, is here to uh, develop curriculum, uh, a uh, shockingly and crazily expensive uh, process. And it's also to do things like uh, 
public outreach through museums and things like that. And, oh, it's gonna like get me weepy here. <laughs> Hershey Julian, for those of you who don't know, uh, was one of our uh, big supporters from the start. And uh, he's uh, not doing so well right now, and, uh, but he's a beautiful man. I wanted to take a, a minute to talk about him. Uh, <laughs> One of my little stories about him is that, uh, you know, he was just this guy, this relentless guy who was always writing about uh, Thorium and always asking me questions. And one day he's like, John, I got a, an article written in the, the Stanford Student uh, Alumni Association thing. I'm like, wow, that's great. And so he sent me a copy and it said something like, like, Hershey Julian, class of 36. And I'm like, what, in 2036? Like he's like he's 10 and he's gonna be graduating. And I called, I think I called up Alex, I'm like, how, how old is Julian? And he's like, oh man, he's old. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so we figured, it, he was, uh, back then he was like 92, 91. And, uh, and I'm like, holy shit, I cannot believe. And, uh, and now he's uh, 96, right? He just turned 96. His birthday was last week and uh, you know, he's such a, you know, I, I hope that uh, I can be like that when I'm uh, older, if I make it that far, to care, you know, at that age, to have such caring for the future generations. Last year, if you remember, we had Katie Hudek, you know, a 12-year-old girl who does these videos about thorium. And, uh, you know, he's, he donated <laughs> money to Katie, and I thought, God, now there's a guy planting seeds for trees that he will never sit in the shade of. You know, that's something we should all aspire to. So Hershey's a, Hershey's a great guy. You know, uh, just uh, I like to help you guys uh, you know, ease into the tech talk by talking a little bit more uh, 30,000 foot idea. You know, there's this idea of uh, Indian uh, perceptual blindness, right? And uh, if you guys never heard about it or you missed it last year, it's this idea that uh, Indians and Aboriginal people, when they saw the tall ships coming, they'd never seen anything like it before. It was a, it was a brand new thing. And a lot of people said they, they had no idea what it was, so they, they literally, the thought was, couldn't see it. Since they didn't know what it was, there, there was no paradigm in their head. They couldn't conceive of it as a piece of transportation. They had nothing in their culture like it. Well, what they now think is that they, they did see it, it, you know, showing up on their retinas, but what it was was that it was still a bad perception. They didn't see, they didn't see it as a threat. Who knows what it was, a big tree. Who, what is that thing on the horizon? It was only when the sailors got into smaller boats that they're like, oh, now I know what that is. That's a thing full of people, and those boats are kind of like our canoes, and, you know, they're a threat. And, but by then, it was too late, right? They, they didn't perceive the threat. They, didn't, they weren't able to conceive of the threat. And so we know perceptual blindness is real. We know it's a real thing. Uh, uh, very famously, when people want to do uh, research in this area, one of the famous experiments was to put, uh, to say, hey, we want you to watch this basketball game, and you got to watch what number 42 does. And then in the middle of the basketball game, they would have a purple gorilla walk through. And then the, after it, they'd say, all right, did you see the purple gorilla? And they're like, there was no purple gorilla. It's like, no, nope, there was a purple gorilla there. You didn't see, and they'll play back, and they're like, holy oh, cow, did I, how do you miss a purple gorilla? Well, because we're, we're, we're humans, and we, we, we're really bad at absorbing information. So it's not just Indians' perceptual blindness, it's everyone, it's our perceptual blindness. And one of the things that we're blind to is the uses of technology. I always love to tell people, you know, the telephone was going to be this broadcast thing. People were going to gather in parks and hear concerts, you know, and the radio was going to be this thing you kept in your pocket and would say, ahoy, ahoy. And, that, you know, for the first hundred years, everyone's like, oh, can you imagine how silly those guys were? Except now it's true. You know, we, we do talk by radios in our pocket, and we watch sporting events and, and operas by telephone lines, DSL lines. So, we're really bad, is what I'm getting at, at understanding what the knock-on effects, what the, what the third order and second order effects of technology are, including the technology that we're, we're here to promote today. Uh, 
So we're really bad. We literally can't per perceive information well. And uh, just like in the se seven years that we've been doing these uh, conferences, one of the things that you get to see as you look at the videos from the first conference, the second, and up until today, is there's a definite evolution of thought and uh, coming down to ground. And, and it's gone from enthusiasts to actual investors and businessmen. Last year I said, you know, we are the most involved, the most aware, the most learned about this, you know, and we can hardly make out that boat on the horizon, right? I mean, we spend so much time doing this, and even we have trouble describing what a world would be like that used this, this technology. How would it affect us? How would it affect society and culture? But we do see it. And the rest of our tribe can't. They can't even understand what it is. And they, they, just like the tall ship, they don't understand. And we have to be the ones that say, that tall ship, that's not a ship full of people that are trying to kill us. That's not a ship full of, that's a thorium ship. And it's a rescue ship. And it's a lifeboat. And it's our duty to tell our tribes to save our tribes and to get them on that boat because that thorium life raft is here to save us all. So that's where I stopped last year. This year, in 2014, the end of that, the sequel to that is how do we get there? How do we get them on the raft? And what are the intended and unintended consequences and what's the price of doing this? So I just want to step in and give some examples from medicine that might be easier to understand. You know, a few years ago, they're like, hey, man, eat some oatmeal. It prevents heart attacks. But now that they know, really, more than the actual oatmeal itself, it's the fact that you fill your gut up with oatmeal, there's no room left over for the bacon and the sausage and stuff. So, so, so yeah, oatmeal prevents heart attacks, but so would, you know, a bag of sawdust, you know, it's, it's, they saw a conclusion, but they didn't understand why they got to that conclusion. One of the most interesting things that's coming along, and who, this is not absolutely proven yet, but there's a lot of uh, legit work. A lot of you know that, you know, the, the common knowledge is, oh, plaques cause Alzheimer's. We got to get rid of these plaques. When you look at an Alzheimer's person's brains, there's plaques in it, right? And Finally, somebody stepped, stepped aside and said, are you looking at all brains? Well, we look at Alzheimer's brains and they look like this. It's like, how do you know that plaques aren't in everybody's brains? And they're like, well, no, well, plaques are a result of Alzheimer's. And the guy's like, well, we're going to go and look. And it turns out that plaques probably don't cause Alzheimer's. They're like scabs. They're trying to heal the brain from Alzheimer's. And all the stuff trying to dissolve the plaques would be like if you skinned your knee and you got up and you're like, ah, God damn it, this scab hurt my knee. It's like, no, the scab isn't what hurt your knee. You damage your knee and the scab is trying to heal it. So all the, a lot of people are very angry because they've gone way down the road of trying to dissolve these plaques when in fact the plaques are the brain scab trying to heal itself. And uh, they've done these studies now where a lot of people have the plaques, and they do have a little bit of dementia, but, uh, but the plaques are, are preserving their, their IQ. So it all goes to say policy based on bad information and bad conclusions is bad policy. The 1985 critical materials and metals list, that's what in 1985 the United States was heavily dependent on foreign suppliers. This is 2011. And it's grown significantly in the last three years over that. We've made really bad policy decisions in this country. We've decided that the dull, dirty, dangerous of mining and processing materials and energy and making alloys and making steel and all that stuff that's not things we want to be involved. We're a knowledge economy, right? But if you don't do things, if you, don't, if you aren't the person who's making the machines, what do you have to contribute to machine design? If you're not the person making the alloys, 
What do you have to contribute to alloys? You can't just say, oh, we're going to be the knowledge economy for the rest of time. But that is the policy that this country has gone down for 30 years. We've decided to deindustrialize, and we're paying today the chickens are coming home to roost. So many of you know that uh, Jim Kennedy and I especially spend uh, an inordinate amount of time in Washington, D.C. trying to solve this. Many of you know, if you don't, that there is a Senate bill the National Rare Earth Cooperative Act, S-2006. Uh, quite an achievement, if I say so myself, that a uh, modestly funded uh, group of folks were able to, without uh, bribing or arm twisting, get several senators, both Republican and Democrat, to uh, submit a bill. But the results of that are that uh, a few weeks ago, the bill was uh, put before the, uh, the Senate for a vote, just to keep it simple. And it turns out that uh, Jim and I have been causing a lot of problems out there, apparently. So uh, when, the, uh, when the S-2006 bill came up, the Department of Defense uh, rose up and said that they, would, uh, that they would very actively oppose it. And so, uh, so as of now, the bill is uh, sort of in a, a pre-death phase. <laughs> it's not dead, but it's not doing so hot. Uh, and uh, I won't go into a lot of uh, discussion about the who's and the why's, because one, we don't know specifically uh, you know, why they did this, why the number one agency that would benefit from having domestic rare earth supply would be against it, but we have our thoughts. And of course, by opposing it, they're also hurting all the industry that would have been benefited from the billions of dollars of foreign direct investment that would have come to this country, the university knowledge and uh, university projects that would have been built up from this. So it's a, it's a huge, huge shame. Uh, but I don't want you to take away from this that, you know, the system, you know, you can't beat City Hall, don't roll over and die. I would hope that this uh, meeting uh, and seeing that there's others of you out there that you don't uh, take it the wrong way and that you double down and pledge to get this done. Uh, and what I want you to do is say that you're going to go to the way today with better tools. You're going to leave Friday with a lot better information. Your job today is to learn about these policies, to learn about this technology. And your goal when you leave here is to make change happen. Because remember, we're the ones who see the lifeboat. And it's our job to get our people on it. Thank you. Thank, thanks all for coming. Uh, I especially want to take this moment to uh, thank the people who put the conference together, especially Vince Lukowski and Tammy Dominowski and Tom Mick. Uh, other members of the board. Yeah, this is Vince right here. Why don't you give him a hand? <laughs> and of course, Tammy's the wonderfully tolerant person out in the elevator lobby that's uh, been uh, uh, dealing with all of us. So uh, uh, thank her when you get a chance. Buy her a drink. You know, pat her on the shoulder and thank her for putting up with all this. <laughs> okay, so that is the start of uh, the 6th Annual Thorium Energy Alliance Conference. I'd ask Vince to get up here and bring the next uh, presentation up. And uh, John Benoche. Uh, John's